Good evening to everyone. Very warm welcome to all our students who are here, our uh, guests, and uh, Dr. Ranga Narayanan, who's uh, the son of uh, T.G. Narayanan. The memorial lecture is called, is the ninth T.G. Narayanan Memorial Lecture that we have today. We have a very distinguished guest who is delivering the lecture. Uh, this is the ninth uh, uh, T.G. Narayanan Memorial Lecture. And our special guest is Dr. Gagandeep Kang. Many of you would have seen her uh, in the media, also talking about very important issues, particularly during co the pandemic. Uh, so I will be introducing Dr. Kang, but I, before that, let me invite uh, Dr. Ranga Narayanan and Dr. Gagandeep Kang to the podium. Before we invite our speakers for the day, uh, I would uh, like, we would like to, as an institution, honor both of them. So we would like to first honor Dr. Gagandeep Kang. We would also like to honor Ms. Dr. Ranga Narayanan. Let me now invite Dr. Ranga Narayanan to say a few words about the TG uh, you know, this whole idea of the T.G. Narayanan Memorial Lecture, as I said, this is the ninth year we are doing this. So you will have some idea of what, who T.G. Narayanan was, and uh, Dr. Ranga Narayan will talk about him. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about the origin of these lecture series. It started, I think, uh, in a conversation I had with uh, Shashi and Ram in, back in 2009. The first lecture, I think, was in 2011 or, you know, or, or thereabouts. And of course, COVID intervention took place. That's why we are at the ninth lecture now. Well, uh, just a few words about uh, the person in whose name these lectures are, are taking place. T.G. Narayan was born on June the 9th, 1911, uh, and his education was at the Madras Christian College. In those days, it was at Georgetown. And it was followed by um, an honors in English at the Madras uh, Presidency College. He spent several years at the Hindu as a war correspondent, uh, during which he covered um, the Imphal Front in, uh, and also events in Southeast Asia. Indonesia uh, specifically. He, he also worked substantially on the famine that overtook Bengal. It was a devastating famine that took uh, well over two and a half million lives. So he saw deprivation firsthand. So that's why the series are on social deprivation. He reported on it and then he analyzed it as well and wrote a book called Famine Over Bengal, describing the cause and the horrors of the famine. Um, so toward the end of the war, T.G. Narayan was stationed in Delhi, and there he spent several months interviewing many of the nation's uh, freedom fighters. The, those were the days that he viewed were the best of his life, that is, uh, his uh, days as a journalist for the Hindu. Um, after the war, he joined the UN, as the chief of the Asiatic uh, Division. This was done at the suggestion of Pandit Nehru. His work involved the War Commission on Germany, the freedom of Indonesia from the Dutch, 
And in his final years, he was the personal representative of the, of the then Secretary General, Dag Hammarskjöld, on, uh, on uh, nuclear disarmament. So that's what led to the Test Ban Treaty that was signed in Moscow. It was, that was signed a year after he died. Now, these series, these lecture series, have had uh, economists, uh, social scientists, activists also, deprivation journalists. Uh, this year, the committee has selected to have a well-known scientist as their speaker. And there is a connection between science and journalism in some of the characteristics. So I want to just say just a couple of lines on that. Excellent journalism and you're all students of journalism, is associated with many of the traits of excellent science. So you seek the bare facts, and then there should be critical thinking, interpretation of those facts, even though they, that interpretation may be subjective, it's interpretation of the facts, but giving due respect to the means of analysis, and then clearly communicating those results to the public, and ensuring that the facts are true and correct. So we are truly appreciative of having a speaker who is an excellent scientist, so carrying these traits. And because T.G. Narayan spent many years as a journalist, and because of his abiding interest in social deprivation and in, and in critical thinking in journalism, that is why it is fitting that we remember him by instituting these lectures in his honor and in his memory. So thank you very much. Thank yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Narayanan. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. Uh, to the, uh, the T.G. Narayanan Memorial Lecture on social deprivation. Uh, we, as I said, uh, Dr. Gagandeep Kang is here to speak to us about access to public sector interventions. Uh, let me give you a very brief uh, introduction to Dr. Kang. Gagandeep Kang is professor of the Wellcome Trust Research Laboratory, Division of Gastrointestinal Sciences at the Christian Medical College in Velour. Uh, she is the, uh, also the professor of microbiology at, at Velour. She has worked on the development and use of vaccines for rotaviruses, cholera, and typhoid, conducting large studies to define burden test vaccines, and measure their impact. Her laboratory has conducted serological and molecular assays for regulatory and non-regulatory studies for vaccines. She studies the consequences of enteric infections and has used multiple birth cohorts to examine the influence of the environment and exposure on immune responses to parasitic, bacterial, and viral enteric infections. In the past two years, she has initiated a number of collaborative research programs on SARS-CoV-2 and, COVID and SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Uh, some of the, you know, as, as I talk about Dr. Kang, and I'll give you this uh, a short bio, uh, you know, biography about her work, uh, some idea of, about her work, there is a lot that may go over our head right now, but I'm sure that Dr. Kang, when she speaks to you, will be able to explain in detail each of these uh, points. And I'm sure it, it should be a fascinating lecture because one of the things that we are very keen on, and I think I've told most of you this, is science journalism and uh, is something that is very, very important. And I, hope, I know that some of you have taken the science elective, and this is an excellent opportunity for all of you to listen to Dr. Kang and to try and understand where she stands on many of these issues. Thank you very much.
Well, I'd like to start by thanking the Asian College of Journalism for inviting me here. It is an honor to be asked to deliver the T.G. Narayanan Memorial Lecture on Social Deprivation. When I started out, I thought I was going to talk to you about lots and lots of public health interventions. It turned out that I had so much to say on the subject of vaccines that I decided to restrict myself to just that. And what I hope to do is to take you through some of the aspects of public health in India, particularly with regard to vaccines. Now, we have a director general of the WHO that has been very much in the news lately, Dr. Tedros, talks a lot about public health. And when he came in for his first term, what he set up was the triple billion target. And the idea was that there should be a billion people that enjoy better health and well-being. There are a billion people that are better protected from health emergencies, and a billion people that would benefit from universal health coverage. The idea was really around access. Which parts of the world don't have access to the kinds of services that allow us to live better lives? Where I come from, public health is about measurement and it's about prevention. So what is it that we can do to stop people from getting sick? And when they get sick, create referral systems for them. And as far as possible, make sure that they don't suffer too many consequences of their illness. And that is very aligned with all of the triple billion targets. So the way I'm going to be speaking to you is to talk to you very briefly about access to certain kinds of facilities in India, talk about vaccination as a public good, what happens with vaccines in India, talk about some of my own research on a vaccine for diarrhea, then about COVID-19 vaccines and the way forward. So coming to um, you know, certain indicators that are important for public health, there is a website that all of you should visit. It's called Geographic Insights. It's run by S.V. Subramaniam at the Harvard School of Public Health. And what he does is he makes the argument that you know, administrative districts don't really make sense. What really matters is who your elected representative is. So he maps things by parliamentary constituencies. So I just want to walk you through some of the examples of what he has on his website. If you look at the figure that is in the blues and reds, that is from the National Family Health Survey. Five, the most recent survey done in 2020-21. And this has information on how different parliamentary constituencies are performing. They are ranked by percentile. So when you look at something by percentile, what you're looking at is a distribution within that group. But if you look at the green and red figures, that is change over time. What happened from NFHS 4 in 2016 and NFHS 5 in 2021? And when you see green, you think green looks fantastic and red doesn't look so good, right? But if you look at the table that is given on uh, the far end of the graph, what I'd like you to look at is the numbers at the bottom which tell you how much things have changed. This is the time of Swachh Bharat, right? Everybody remember Swachh Bharat? Right. So if you look at what has changed, we were at 40 plus percent in NFHS 4, households with improved sanitation. That went up to 71%. So that is a change of approximately 21% in households that over this five-year period changed their access to improved sanitation in a positive direction. 
Let's look at clean cooking fuel. This matters to women. So clean cooking fuel, how much change happened. The same setup for the graphs, but look at the numbers now. We went from 42% of households using clean cooking fuels and that improved to about 57%, a 15% improvement over five years. There was a governmental program to make sure that women that didn't have cooking gas were provided with cooking gas during this time. So you have Swachh Bharat, you have, what was it called, Ujwala, the intervention that led to this happening. That was the good news. Okay, now this is anemia in women by parliamentary constituencies and again, focus on the table at the end. 52%, it went up to 53%. Not only did we not make a difference for anemia, we had a marginal, small increase in anemia in all women in India. So even though the figures show you lots of greens, actually it's been heading in the wrong direction in terms of public health interventions. Let's take a look at what I'm interested in, children. Stunting is a measure of chronic deprivation. Children who are deprived of food over long periods of time look normal. They are not skinny, shriveled children. Those skinny, shriveled children are acute malnutrition. Stunting, which is being short for your age, is a measure of chronic deprivation. What happened to stunting? We went from 35% to 33%, approximately 2% change in five years. So all the feeding programs that we are doing, this is the difference. Bangladesh is doing better than India. They have come under 30% now. We don't seem to be able to have their trajectory. Now coming to vaccination. Full vaccination in children under the age of five. Our vaccination programs until SARS-CoV-2 were just routine vaccination for children under the age of 18 months and then pregnant women getting tetanus immunization. So full immunization here, we went from just over 70% to about 85% a distinct improvement that happened between the two NFHS surveys. So now why are vaccines important? Vaccines, I have to say I am wholly, solely in favor of vaccines. I don't think anything is 100% safe, but vaccines prevent disease, otherwise we wouldn't have them available to us. So why are vaccines a public good? Vaccines are measured by WHO to save somewhere between two and three million lives a year. So this is a gift that keeps on giving. The more you use vaccines, the lower the number of deaths that you have in children. We've managed to wipe out polio uh, in almost all parts of the world, only Pakistan and Afghanistan, and that too in high conflict settings have polio anymore. Smallpox was gone before you were born, and it was just vaccines that have achieved the control of these two diseases. So if we put our minds to it, there is a lot that we can do to prevent and to eradicate disease using vaccines. Now, vaccines, you know, you think of vaccines as just preventing disease, but that is actually a very narrow view of the value of vaccines. When a child, for example, has diarrhea, does the mother go to work or the father? If a child winds up in hospital, the family incurs costs, parents don't go to work. That results, if you are a daily wage worker, that results in a loss of greater income. So the impact of preventing disease go well beyond just preventing a child from being sick for a couple of days. Now if you look at narrow 
or broad productivity, actually you're not seeing what the full value of vaccines can be on a society. I'm not going to walk you through this entire really complicated diagram, but just to say that if you look at the impact of vaccination, it's not just about children living longer. It's not just about caregivers needing to not go to work. It's not just about children actually staying in school because they are well and therefore having improved cognition. It's not just about lower health care expenditure. It's not about families just having resources to be able to spend more. It is all of these taken together that mean that preventing disease, promoting health is really good for society. Now, who has access to vaccines? I think the problem really is that this is the chart from the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. The Indian Academy of Pediatrics is 39,000 private, mostly private, pediatricians in the country. If you can pay for a vaccine, you can get everything that is on this table. It takes you from the time you are born to the time that you are 18 years old. All of these vaccines are not available to all of the children in our country. In order to have a vaccine that is available to all children, it needs to be in the national immunization program. And the IAP recommended vaccines are not all in the program. These are the vaccines that are in the program and they have, you know, I'm not going to uh, explain every vaccine to you, but this is a report from the WHO and UNICEF that shows what percentage of children in the country get each vaccine. So these are vaccines. BCG is received at birth. DPT 1 and 3 are received at 10, uh, at 6 and 14 weeks of life. And then you have polio also received by 14 weeks of life, MCV, the measles containing vaccine at nine months, hepatitis B along with routine immunization, etc. What do I want you to see? I want you to look at this bottom graph. Here you can see that the vaccines were there in 2010 and have continued to stay at about 75, 80%, the figures that we saw in the NFHS throughout. These vaccines were introduced into the national program in the 1970s. MCV1 was introduced in 1986. From 1986 to 2010, we had no new vaccines introduced for the children of India. The first vaccine that came in after that was when we converted from this DPT, a trivalent vaccine, to a pentavalent vaccine that also contained hepatitis B and Hib. So you see the numbers for Hib and for hepatitis B go up when you give a single shot that has five vaccines in it instead of the previous three. Then you have the disease that I work on, rotavirus, which was introduced into the national program in 2016, and that's the story I'm going to tell you. And we have a pneumococcal vaccine that has just been introduced into our national program. Now, one thing I'd like you to understand is that when we say 75%, when we say 80%, there is a lot that is buried inside those numbers. So here, what I'm showing you is NFHS 5 data comparing Bihar and Karnataka, a northern state, a southern state, a state with good socioeconomic indicators, a state with poor indicators. What you have here is just look at 62 and 63, these are about immunization. You see that you have here urban children, rural children, and all children, and what had happened in NFHS 4. You see that you have 84%, 86%, 86%, and uh, the previous figure was 79%. 
Here, if you look at that same indicator, 89%, 92%, 91%, 82%. This is the best performance that we have ever had for vaccines in the program. And because immunization is a program that has invested a lot, even though the two states do very differently, immunization actually winds up preventing a lot of disease in children that live in deprived areas. Now, two aspects of immunization I'd like to bring up. I told you that new vaccines can be introduced at different points in time from 86 to 2010. We didn't really have a difference in the vaccines that were, you know, we didn't have new vaccines introduced. This is from the UK. And what I'd like to show you here is when you had diphtheria vaccine introduced, 1942, pertussis in 57, measles in 68. In India, that same vaccine came in in 1986. If you look at the Haemophilus influenza vaccine, they introduced in 1992. We introduced it as part of the pentavalent in 2009. It's not that it wasn't available in the private market. This vaccine was in the private market in the 1990s, but you couldn't get it for children in the routine immunization program till then. When it comes to pneumococcal vaccines, 2006 as a UK was a late country to introduce pneumococcal vaccine. They introduced in 2006. In India, we started in 2020. And only this year have we reached countrywide immunization. So there is a delay between rich countries and poor countries. And then within poor countries, and I'm calling us a poor country, uh, there is a difference between who can access private care and who can access public care. And this is not unique to us. It is something that is recognized globally. There are some children who never receive vaccines. 80% coverage in India means that 3 million children do not get immunized at all. Our birth cohort is 2.7 million. So if we have 80% coverage or 90% coverage, somewhere between three and four and a half million children are not getting their vaccines. And globally, if you look at children that don't receive vaccines, the children that are called zero dose children, these are the most deprived children there are. And when you look at who those children are, they usually belong to the poorest wealth quintile. They live in rural areas. They have mothers that are not educated. If you look at that on a map, and this is a map just looking at wealth quintiles and the inequities in distribution of vaccines, you can see that in India, we have quite a reasonable degree of a, you know, about a 20% difference between immunization in the richest people and in the poorest people in our country. So now I'm going to talk to you about rotavirus. Now, rotavirus, before we get to rotavirus, what does it take to introduce a vaccine into a program? For a country to introduce a vaccine into the program, you have to know that you have the disease. You have to have a vaccine that works and you need to have a program that can deliver the vaccines. It's relatively simple, the three aspects, the disease, the vaccines, and the strength of the immunization program. It's a little bit different when you come to pandemics, and we will discuss the pandemic very briefly. But for rotavirus, first you needed to know how much of the disease that we have in the country is caused by rotavirus. Rotavirus is the number one cause of dehydrating gastroenteritis in children. Um, so in India, diarrhea is pretty common. Anyone in this audience not had diarrhea? Anybody? Anybody have siblings? If you have really young siblings and cousins, you'll know they have lots of diarrhea. 
and rotavirus causes somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the diarrhea in young children if they haven't been vaccinated. Now the problem of course is that for diarrhea we have a very good solution and pediatricians will tell you oral rehydration is the solution to all diarrheas. The problem is with viral gastroenteritis you get vomiting and diarrhea. If you have vomiting then oral rehydration can't be done. And because children have relative to their body size a large surface area they get dehydrated very quickly. So if you don't get a child to care quickly, you will that child can die. Because starting an IV, if you want to, on a collapsed vein is very difficult. So in rural areas, remote areas, without access to health care, children die. Now rotavirus is a very democratic virus, as viruses are. You know, if you have really good hygiene and sanitation, it doesn't prevent the disease, it just delays it. So this is what you see in remote rural areas. You see children that are shriveled, shrunken. We do something called a skin pinch test. If you're dehydrated, the skin goes back very, very slowly. And a lot of children die. You can see where the children die. It's largely sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. In India, it's been estimated in 2019 that 6.6% of the deaths that occurred in young children in India were due to diarrhea. Most of it would have been rotavirus. Now, surprisingly, for a diarrheal disease, the first vaccine that was licensed was licensed in the US. Why do you think? Well, I said rotavirus is a democratic virus. Parents don't want to take time off when their children are sick. So if you have a vaccine that prevents diarrhea in children, then that is something that health insurers are very willing to pay for. So the very first vaccine was introduced in 1998 in the US. It was a vaccine that had been evaluated in the US. They gave out one and a half million doses of the vaccine and then withdrew the vaccine because it had a very significant side effect. It caused a telescoping of one part of the gut into another part. This is called intersusception. So if you take a glove, for example, and you shove the finger of the glove in, you, that's what happens to the intestine. And it can get stuck there. And if it gets stuck, it can get infected, gangrenous, and the child can die. But if you give an enema, essentially what it does is it pushes the intersusception out. So if you recognize it early, it's not fatal. But if you don't have access to care, it can be fatal. So it, this vaccine was withdrawn, but it was estimated that about 1 in 10,000 vaccinated children did have this side effect. So a number of studies were done to see whether we could still have a rotavirus vaccine that worked. And two big companies, GSK and Merck, made vaccines. They had to test the vaccines in very large clinical trials, 60, 70,000 children, because they had to figure out is there a risk of intersusception or not. When they made the vaccine, the vaccine came into the market in 2006, and it cost $200 to vaccinate one child. Within two years, that vaccines, those vaccines were available in India. And they cost 1,200 rupees for the three dose, for each dose, so 3,600 for a course, or 1,800 rupees for the two dose version of the vaccine, still 3,600 rupees for a dose. We did a calculation at the time and figured out that if we introduced the rotavirus vaccine for Indian children, we would essentially wipe out the entire vaccination budget for the country. There would be no money left at this price for anything else for our children. So obviously that wasn't going to work. We had also been doing a study trying to figure out how much did rotavirus matter. 
And we found that in India, in the West, three out of five children hospitalized for diarrhea have rotavirus. In India, we have so many causes of diarrhea that it was only two out of five children that were hospitalized for diarrhea had rotavirus infections. And this was, you know, building that burden estimate for India can be quite challenging because you need to get out there and actually measure the disease because nobody tests for why a child has diarrhea. So we had to build this infrastructure. I was doing a lot of studies at the time and we built what is called a disease pyramid, which is essentially how many children actually have infection or disease at all, and we found that one in every two children in India had a rotavirus infection, one in eight needed to have an outpatient visit, one in 30 children would wind up in a hospital because of a rotavirus gastroenteritis, and at that time, one in 650 children born in India would die of a rotavirus gastroenteritis. So this was the burden of disease estimate that we built. I told you three parts to introducing a vaccine, show that you have the disease, show that you have a vaccine, and show that your immunization system is ready for that. This was the disease burden estimate, but in addition to that, we looked at costing to figure out in the places where we were doing these studies, mainly government hospitals, what proportion of the people were actually borrowing money in order to pay for their child's hospitalization. And in the poorest group, up to 80% of families were borrowing money to pay for the hospitalization. Overall, it was 5% of every family's annual income to pay for three days hospitalization for a child. So there was a very significant impact, particularly on the poorest families. So we worked on developing an Indian vaccine with Bharat Biotech. We had a strain that had been identified by a pediatrician in, Chen in Delhi, uh, Dr. Bhan. That vaccine was taken through the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program and with Bharat Biotech over a 10-year development process, we finally were able to deliver a vaccine at a dollar a dose. That vaccine now costs 49 rupees to the immunization program. The only reason that we can have the vaccine in India in the na national program is because we make it ourselves. But this was the first vaccine where the entire development process had been done in India. And the reason for doing that was that we knew rich kids in India were already getting the GSK and Merck vaccines, but we wanted a product that could be delivered to every child in the country. So in 2016, this vaccine was introduced into the national program. And by the end of 2019, we had this vaccine in every state in the country. I have to tell you that the pediatricians were quite resistant to this vaccine, particularly in Kerala, because they thought that they would lose business if children with diarrhea were not hospitalized in their hospitals. So, for the very first time, we also decided to do an impact assessment. Now that we have introduced the vaccine, does it really make a difference or not? So we set up to do studies in 28 different hospitals across the country. And this is what we saw. The blue dotted line is the coverage of vaccine. Rotavirus is a seasonal disease. It's mostly in the winters, so you can see the pattern before the vaccine is introduced, and you can see after the vaccine has been introduced, the proportion of rotavirus really goes down. Now, I had told you that, so we are preventing disease. And if you talk to pediatricians now, they'll tell you that their diarrhea wards are no longer full. In fact, many hospitals have closed their diarrhea wards because children are not getting hospitalized anymore. I'd also pointed out to you that there was a safety event with the vaccines. 
the intersusception that had happened with the vaccines that were used in the US and actually even with the GSK and the Merck vaccines, later it was found that though the risk was lower than with the original vaccine, there was still a risk of the side effect. But we did a study in India and essentially showed that with the Rotavac vaccine, there was no evidence of increased intersusception after any dose of the vaccine. So it's important to monitor efficacy but it's important also to be honest about side effects and to monitor those side effects. This is a lesson that we completely ignored for COVID. So I'll come to COVID-19 vaccines very briefly now. And this was the figures that were very much in the news in March 2021 that most of the vaccine doses were going to Europe and the US. India hadn't really ramped up production in 2021. And India was a key partner with South Africa in saying that we shouldn't be thinking about intellectual property at this time. We should be thinking about TRIPS waivers. That's something we've gone back a bit on now. But there was a serious equity issue when it came to SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Where are we today? This is our world in data. And you can see that if you look at the number of people that have been, this graph does not include China, but if you look at the number of people that have been vaccinated against COVID, in India, it's over a billion people. This is the entire population, not including children. So we have a high number vaccinated. China has a little bit more, but we are the two countries that have over a billion population. But if you look at coverage rates, we are still doing pretty well. We have 72% of our population that has been vaccinated. So India has done really well with the vaccination. Again, why have we done well? We've done well because we made our own vaccines. It meant that we didn't have access to every class of product, but we had access to at least two products that worked well worked in terms of preventing disease. But there were lots and lots of controversies and none of these will I go into at the moment. The clinical trials, um, anybody remember any problems with the clinical trials with COVID vaccines in India? Well, if you were um, in Bhopal, the People's Medical College was recruiting people without taking informed consent, and that is a serious ethical violation. We are the first, and well, the first country to have something called clinical trial mode for vaccines, at least in the, uh, Russia and in China. They license the vaccines without completing the clinical trials but we were the only ones to give it this new label. We had the COVID app, which was only in English initially, if you recall, again, meaning that people who did not, uh, you know, could not necessarily access appointments in the early stages. If you look at Decision making, I've been part of the vaccine advisory committees for the government for a very long time on the national technical boards. But I can tell you that there was a great divide between the science and the implementation. One particular thing that bothered me a lot was the rapid age de-escalation. We went without vaccinating the elderly, we went down in age groups very quickly, which meant that during the Delta wave, a large proportion of our elderly continued to be vulnerable. That was unnecessary, and those deaths are unlikely to be quantified. Uh, rural urban bookings, lots of people, particularly in Andhra Pradesh from Hyderabad, were going out to rural areas and using up the booking slots that were uh, 
intended for rural populations at a time when supply was limited. We had plenty of anti-vaxxers and I have to tell you that uh, we're not really keeping up with the approaches or the technologies that people use to spread messages about how vaccines do harm. We saw that during the measles rubella campaigns initially. We saw that before that for polio. But it seems like now whenever we have a new vaccine, there are messages that target defined portions of the population with what appeals to them, saying people should not be vaccinated. We are not as extreme as the US, but it is something that seems to be coming. And then I don't know if you remember the chaos that we had for a couple of months in 2021 when the government decided that people under 45 were a special category and states had to buy vaccines to immunize them. So in terms of decision making for what resulted in equity and access, there were a number of missteps. But fortunately, we made it through that. Sorry. So it's been estimated by the WHO that COVID-19 vaccines have actually saved about 20 million lives. But had we had equity and more equitable distribution of vaccines, we could potentially have saved at least 600,000 people more, mostly people that live in low and middle income countries. So this is a situation that is reviewed by WHO quite frequently. And we've done a brilliant job with getting COVID vaccines out quickly and out to a large proportion of the world, missteps notwithstanding. But COVID has had another impact on vaccination. And the problem is that with COVID, what happened was that routine immunization that was looking pretty good before COVID actually went down. And it went down more in low-income countries than it did in high-income countries. So we wound up with 23 million children that did not receive vaccines in 2020. That figure went up to 25 million children that had not received a single dose of vaccine in 2021. And the problem is once you've missed your first doses of vaccine, your access to the healthcare system changes entirely. Because that is the time when mothers are most likely to bring their children for their checkups, for getting height and weight measured, as well as for being vaccinated. Once that period is over, the children don't come back into the system. And the consequences of that is something that we will recognize only in the future. So if you look at zero dose children, which is now a primary focus for everybody involved in immunization, India has 2.7 million children that have not received a single dose of DPT. For measles vaccine, we are second to Nigeria, but that's not any kind of accolade. Uh, Nigeria has 3.1 million, we have 2.5 million that have not received a measles vaccine. There are now measles outbreaks occurring all around the world. Measles is a virus that is only slightly more infectious than Omicron, and you know how infection, infectious Omicron is. It has a, what is called a reproductive rate of 15. If you have a completely unimmunized population, one infected person will spread that disease to 15 other people. With Omicron, we believe that the reproductive rate in a naive population would be somewhere around 11 or 12. So measles is more infectious than that. So wherever there is a gap in immunization, measles will come through and will make sure children get infected. And children, especially children who are malnourished, die of measles infections. I'll just give you one example of where India is. This is 
probably the best performing vaccine we have in our system because this gets given in hospitals at birth. We've had a great push to have women deliver more in hospitals, but even for BCG, we have seen a decline from about 90% down to 84% of BCG being given to children. 84% doesn't sound like we are doing so badly, but remember that 2.7 million is 10%. So we are talking 4 million children born in 2021 that did not receive a BCG vaccine. Now, I'd like to talk, end on a slightly more optimistic note and talk about opportunities. And I think one of the things that we have recognized, especially because we made COVID vaccines, is that we have the ability to do many things. So far, the way it has been is that we have 80% of the world's population in low and middle income countries and about 20% of vaccine use. But this is a picture that is changing. We've also recognized that we can use new technologies. So we had gotten up to glycoconjugation before the pandemic, and we have now leapfrogged into next generation technologies in India. Our companies are capable of making vaccines on every platform that exists so far. Now, previously, what used to happen in low and middle income countries was we took old vaccines and then we made them in our countries so that we could decrease the price. The rotavirus vaccine I told you about was an example of that, a vaccine being made in the West, but we made it in India to decrease the cost and increase access. But what we are doing now is we are taking the entire chain of development of vaccines through the new technologies and making them in India. So what we are seeing is that manufacturing capacity is moving now from the global north to the global south, and we have very real opportunities to be able to protect more of our populations against more diseases, and that's what leads to equity. So very quickly, you can actually do vaccines before a child is born. Right now, we do tetanus, hepatitis B, and SARS-CoV-2. Shown here in green are vaccines that exist that we could be using. Shown in gray are vaccines that are in very late stage testing but not yet licensed. Shown in red are important diseases for which we don't yet have vaccines. So you can start before birth, you can add to what is being done for infants and for children, you can give vaccines to adolescents, a platform that we do not currently have, you can add more vaccines to adults, you can protect the elderly against diseases, you can look at vaccines that are needed specifically for our own geographies. The opportunities are immense for both routine immunization and for emerging infections. So now the world has what is called the immunization agenda, which is that everyone, everywhere, at every age should fully benefit from vaccines for their good health and well-being. So if we look at where we are going, we need science, and we need products in order to be able to impact the health of all of society. And I showed you that the technologies exist. What I'd like to point out for you is how much of a difference intention can make. TB is an old disease. We've had it for a long time. SARS-CoV-2 is a new disease. We've had it for three years. For SARS-CoV-2, we were able to come up with multiple products. For TB, we continue to struggle. But even here with mRNA, with the new technologies, people have begun to think about what we can do to prevent old diseases as well as new ones. The problem, of course, in India is that nobody likes clinical trials. So how you do any testing of a product 
without turning people into guinea pigs? I don't know. So this is where we need media as partners to show that experimentation and human experimentation are not wrong. You just need to make sure that it is done in the right way. I'll just tell you about why people think uh, diseases are a problem. They think you're going to have all kinds of untoward effects. So I'd just like to point out aspirin has plenty of untoward effects. Zinc has lots of untoward effects. Water can poison you. So recognizing risk, being able to communicate about risk is a key feature in doing clinical research well. We have the capacity to do it in India and we will need to do it if we want to develop vaccines for all of our population. Now for anything that we introduce as an intervention, we also need to be able to measure impact and that requires for us to be able to improve our data systems and make sure that we know what we are measuring is being measured accurately. I'd just like to end with the sustainable development goals and point out to you that these goals are intended for us for uh, 2030. Among them, only goal three is good health and well-being. But I will argue that many more goals actually involve having vaccines in them. So for example, if you have immunized healthy children, that means that you will have a productive future workforce that leads to strong economies that results in goal one, which is no poverty. Overall, there are 17 goals and 14 of them immunization can play a role. So just to end, I think access to preventive interventions is a human right. Thank you. Yeah, we could take a few questions if there are any questions. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, my, my name's Aryan, hello. Uh, you mentioned a vaccine uh, that was introduced in the UK in the 1992 and in India in 2009. So I'm trying to understand that this 17-year difference, is this a problem of the market, a problem of procurement, budgetary constraints, or intent? Which one is it? This particular vaccine, the Haemophilus Influenza B vaccine, was a cheap vaccine, could and was being made in India, was well, it was made from 2001 onwards. So the gap from 1992 to 2001 was because the vaccine outside was expensive. When the vaccine started to be made in India, it was cheaper. But then there was a very virulent anti-vaccine lobby that would not allow the vaccine to come into the program. So we lost about eight years because of the anti-vax lobby and the only way it came into the program was because we were able to slide it in with pentavalent. Not adding one vaccine, but changing the entire formulation that was being given to children. Yeah. Uh, just wait for the yeah. mic. I think there's a yeah. Somebody else there? Right. Um, hello. Uh, Ma'am, my name is Saman Hussain. Uh, I had a question. So recently there's been a stark rise in the number of heart attacks, especially among young individuals. Um, like we talked about the side effects of aspirin and zinc. Could this be a side effect of COVID? What do you think? So COVID does affect the lining of the blood vessels. And COVID itself can lead to clotting events. It causes both large clots and small clots. So it's possible to have uh, cardiac events following COVID, during COVID infections and potentially following COVID infections if those clots get dislodged. You can also have with some of the adenovirus vectored vaccines like Covishield and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you have a very specific condition there called thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, which occurs in one in about 100,000 vaccinated people. 
that have uh, an autoimmune antibody to platelet factor 4. So you can't predict who will have that complication, but about 1 in 100,000 people can have a complication that results in clots because of vaccination. It's important to recognize it because there is a treatment. If, you know, in the news there have been lots of stories of young women, particularly dying after Covishield vaccination. When I read those case histories, it's because it wasn't recognized as an adverse event following immunization and they did not receive the right treatment. The right treatment is intravenous immunoglobulin. In Australia, the case fatality rate for this condition is 3%. In India, from what I've heard, it's closer to 70 or 80 percent. Uh, Ma'am, my name is Upasika. Uh, with uh, how we saw that uh, with the Rota vaccine and the COVID vaccine becoming cheaper and more accessible because it was made in India, is there any policies that we can look forward to where Bharat Biotech is expanded into making more vaccines and sort of making it an Indian industry of some sort? Bharat Biotech has a portfolio of um, a malaria vaccine. They are looking at a TB vaccine. So really about making vaccines not only for India, but for poorer parts of the world where the big four, now big five vaccine manufacturers are not interested in low income markets. So the whole story of vaccines and access is, plays out in politics, plays out in economics, plays out in ethics. Oh, yeah. Serum Institute is actually the biggest vaccine manufacturer in the world. So about 60% of all the vaccines that are used for routine immunization in Latin America are made in India. Hi, uh, my name is Anisha, I'm a faculty member. You mentioned that uh, you compared the development of vaccines for COVID and for TB and you talked about intention. Uh, could you talk more about that because during the COVID coverage that was happening, it basically turned out a lot of health reporters spoke about how TBs actually killed a lot more people than COVID has. So why the difference in intent? Well, so here's the science bit. It's easier to make vaccines for viruses than for bacteria. Viruses are much less complicated because they have fewer proteins, so to figure out which proteins to target becomes easier. TB is an intracellular pathogen. It actually hides within your own cells. So once it's gotten into that niche, it's very difficult to be able to attack TB. The only time you can get at, get at it is if it kills the cell and it's outside for a little while. So it becomes a lot more complicated to, you know, vaccines have to be given to healthy people. So vaccines have to be extremely safe or they need to have very rare, identifiable side effects that you can do something about. With anything that is intracellular, attacking that pathogen means attacking yourself. So your safety concerns become that much higher. So TB has been a challenge, but right now we've got, so the only TB vaccine we have now is 100 years old. And there are two vaccines in development that have some promise, but I'm not sure that TB will be solved entirely by vaccination. Yeah. Hello, thank you for your lecture. I think it really focused on how vaccination is very important to combat a lot of these diseases. I'm just thinking about, um, I think, the way forward, like, um, there are, like, while uh, vaccines are very important, some of the diseases that are caused, um, like vaccines do seem like a sort of remedial option in the way that once we have seen a disease come in and then we can figure out how to combat it and then there can be a mass vaccin um, vaccination which will help prevent the disease further on. And at the same time I feel like some of the diseases themselves are caused due to overall living conditions 
poor access to health resources and poor access to sanitation and just regular living conditions. Even um, for, for example, there are sp uh, specifically a lot of breathing problems and a lot of other diseases that are caused specifically due to working conditions and all of that. So, in, so considering all of that, how do public health, like how do you see public health interventions associating and relating with um, more overall policy interventions? Yeah, the second, I'm just curious, um, there was this point where you said about um, you would, uh, you're looking forward to seeing media as partners of vaccination programs. So if you could just elaborate on that a bit. Sure. There was one very interesting. So point. as an example, let me, let's take cholera. Right? Cholera is a disease of unsanitary living conditions. Rich people don't get cholera. The rich world does not get cholera. So should we be fixing water and sanitation? Or should we be making a cholera vaccine? Okay, I think we should fix water and sanitation because water and sanitation solves a lot of problems beyond cholera. But in a hundred years, we haven't fixed water and sanitation in our settings. So cholera is an adjunctive tool that we can use. The vaccine can be used until we get to a point where the vaccine is no longer needed. So in public health, I don't think we should focus on one intervention. We should be integrating as much as possible and improving the living conditions of people is an absolute imperative. The problem is the investments are large and take a lot of time. So for example, in the US, there is a worry now that all the water systems are so old that they need to replace them and it's been estimated that the costs will run into tens of billions of dollars. So in India, it's been estimated that to really fix our water and sanitation, the price tag is $72 billion. Vaccines are a cheaper, but also temporary solution. In terms of the media being partners, I think you know, the reach of media, academics like me, scientists like me, don't think that this is our job. Right? Uh, I kind of got into talking to people because there was so much misinformation out there. And uh, when people reached out to me, I tried to explain things. But I think people who are skilled in communication know how to reach their audiences, actually make for better science communicators or better communicators of science. Scientists, communicators have a role to play, but ultimately, I think in terms of scale, it really needs to be people who are in the profession to do it. Introduce yourselves, please. Hello, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Gesu Bhardwaj. And uh, the question that I had was, since yesteryears now, medicine seems to ignore women in the entire debate of formulating medicines, right? Uh, women and men, they're very different biologically, but they're prescribed the same drugs. How far do you think this debate has made into the entire vaccine creating forum? Take the example of alterations in menstrual cycles that were reported with COVID-19 vaccines. Ultimately, it required a study to show that one, there were aberrations and that they were temporary. That it, within a couple of cycles, most women reverted back to normal. But this was not something that had been studied. Nor has it been studied, is there a difference in the antibody responses that you make if you are vaccinated at different points in your cycle? So I agree with you. We've been ignoring biology. The normative is a 70 kilo white man. And then you use a drug on a 40 kilo woman for the same dose is not going to be appropriate. So there are lots of issues that need to be sorted out, but at least there is recognition that there is a problem. Somebody else? 
My question is about research and development. Uh, we often hear of uh, research and development should be there and policy intervention should be there. But I have a doubt that uh, this uh, under-representation of uh, uh, health sector in India, especially uh, living about other developed countries, my question is that uh, why this scenario is prevailing like uh, the shortage of, is, is this because of the shortage of resources or interventions or policy measures from the government or is this a uh, loss of uh, less workforce or technology or the education, inadequate education in terms of research and development? And the second question is uh, research and development in terms of vaccination in particular. Uh, can we just follow uh, other countries' interventions so far, the developed, the so-called development, developed countries and the rest of the world, or uh, for a diverse country like India, should we have any special research and development being in terms of vaccination, and for that matter, health sector, which is being very pathetically neglected in our country? Sure. So, first is India is a country which. Post-independence developed a strong science base that has to some extent been eroded over time. The problem for biology and medicine in particular was that biology was put into institutions and not universities. So special institutions were created for research that were not linked to a research ecosystem in a university and they were not linked to hospitals that actually saw patients. So the Indian Council for Medical Research, for example, has one hospital, and even that one it's trying to get rid of, right? So academic clinical research doesn't happen, and to test products, as I said, you need human guinea pigs. So we have not had the ecosystem to allow us to do clinical evaluations. That is something that needs to change. But in terms of R&D, we are good at certain aspects of science and certain aspects of technology. We are very strong in physics, in astronomy, in chemistry. We are not up there in biology. But for many technologies, we've traditionally been reasonably good. So it's a complicated landscape, and it's never been addressed in its entirety with a strategy that says we know where we are going. So for an example, I'll give you an example from Korea, where Korea set the goal that we want to be number five in the world to make vaccines in 10 years. And the strategy started with how they were funding their startups, what kind of university industry linkages they needed to happen, what government support was re required, what enablers were there for industry to participate. With the result that Korea is now making products not just for its own population, but for the world. And that's only going to increase over time. Now, in terms of when we think about policies that drive research and development, what you need is this kind of strategy which we haven't had. India has a lot of documents, science, technology, and innovation policy. From 1953 onwards, we've had a series of documents. We're very good on paper. We're not very good at actually doing things. The new national education policy that we have, I hope, will change things. I hope the National Research Foundation will change things. But so far, we haven't had those changes. In terms of health itself, health is not a subject that excites politicians in the absence of a pandemic. And that, I think, is our fault. Why is it not an electoral issue? Why is it something that is not being emphasized as a service to people? Why are freebies okay, but not the fact that we have access to the level of care that is really needed? It's better in Tamil Nadu than many other places, but it really still isn't 
a subject that comes up on election manifestos. We'll take one last question. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. My name is Krishna and thank you so much for this insightful lecture. My question is that we are a country of billion people. How challenging is, challenging is for the government, for anyone to actually vaccinate each and every person in her, to, to the, every household? And what was the challenges was like before and how we like got, got there that we able to vaccine billion people in such a such a short span and what we can do for the use of technology. And the second question is that uh, we saw the COVID-19, which was like a big up call for us to rebuild our health infrastructure. Uh, I'm asking, do you think that we actually taking this big up call seriously and doing the rebuild of this infrastructure or we think for one more track you have no so for vaccines, we built on what we have done over the last two decades. We've really strengthened our ability to store vaccines, to deliver vaccines. We have uh, 27,000 points at which in the country we deliver fixed immunization. We have 9,000 cold chain stores. This is the largest infrastructure for vaccination in the world and we used it well to be able to deliver vaccines. Uh, if for COVID vaccines, as I mentioned, I thought we could have done better by focusing on the elderly first and then moving to other ages in the population. But by and large, I think we did a really outstanding job. The COVID app that was developed for SARS-CoV-2 was actually a modification of a vaccine infrastructure app that existed, but is now going to be used for other vaccines as well. And hopefully we will have better quality data being captured on immunization. Is this a wake-up call and are we going to change things? Well, the World Bank has given us a billion dollars to change things so that our infrastructure improves. But we have many systemic issues, and I think the good states will do well, the poor states will do less well. I hope I'm wrong. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.